Welcome, everyone. I am Dr. Crystal Downing, and I am the co-director of the Marion E. Wade Center with my husband, David Downing, who's sitting down from opening the windows. We're sorry the room is so stuffy. We're going to have to work on our air conditioning here. I am delighted to be able to introduce the speakers for this evening who are working collaboratively on a book called The Odious odious necessity I mean, what an interesting title the odious necessity c.s lewis on war and warrior virtue and come on in there's some chairs in the middle here some chairs up front we want everybody to be able to get a good seat this is um, a topic that is also going to be addressed in the next issue of Seven, which is the academic journal produced by the Wade. There is an article, and it will be published sometime uh, later this fall, by Clark Moreland called The Sword of Damocles, C.S. Lewis and the Cold War, assessing how the Cold War may have changed C.S. Lewis's attitudes and approaches to the idea of just war theory. Come on in, there's some uh, seats up front, and uh, please make yourself comfortable. Okay, our first speaker, and you, you get a little bit about them, we're actually starting the first speaker, Eric Patterson, as you can see, is president of the Religious Freedom Institute in Washington, D.C., and he focuses his scholarship on the intersection of religion, ethics, and foreign policy. An intersection shaped not only through his two stints at the US Department of State's Bureau of Political Military Affairs, but also by working in places like, like Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Congo, Angola. Patterson served over 20 years as an officer and commander in the Air National Guard. And one of his tasks I found out over lunch is he was conductor of the military band. So that's a kind of a nice little tidbit about him. He plays trumpet. And we have some professional musicians here tonight. So you'll be interested in that. He has also worked as a White House Fellow with the Director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. And um, he is the author or editor of nearly 20 books. His essays have been published in both academic journals as well as popular outlets like the Washington Post and the Washington Times. And he regularly writes for World Opinions as well as Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. Plus, he and I have something in common. We are both gauchos, which, <laughs> which means we both got our PhDs at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Now, his was in politics, which is probably not too surprising considering all the things he's done. Mine is in English, which probably isn't too surprising. But here's something interesting I haven't even told him yet. Both of us have published articles on Reinhold Niebuhr. So I talk about Niebuhr and C.S. Lewis and uh, Dorothy Sayers and how they responded to him. And I assume he's talking about the influence Niebuhr has in the political arena. When I was writing the essay, I went and visited the statue of Niebuhr that's on Elmhurst College campus. Our second speaker, Mark Levecki, is the McDonald Distinguished Scholar on Ethics, War, and Public Life at Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. He also serves as a non-resident research scholar at the U.S. Naval War College, focusing on leadership and ethics. He has a PhD from Yale University of Chicago, and he has taught in university classes around the U.S. and Europe, including the U.S. Naval Academy, as well as adjunct gigs here at Wheaton College. So there's some people here who may have known him as a colleague back in the day. <laughs> 
In addition to his collaboration with Patterson on the odious necessity, Mark is the author of an Oxford University Press book called The Good Kill, Just War and Moral Injury, and a forthcoming book called The Moral Horror, A Just War Defense of the Bombing of Hiroshima. Doesn't that sound interesting? I also found out over lunch that Mark was like C.S. Lewis in so far as as an adolescent, he was an atheist. And part of what brought him to faith also explains who he is today in that as he started learning about the horrors of the Holocaust, he was grappling with what are the philosophical foundations for ethics. And in the process, a professor gave him a copy of Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And that helped move him in the direction of faith. If any of you need any hearing enhancement devices, um, you could slip out now. Our office manager is standing in the doorway, and she has one for you. I also want you to know that um, after the presentations, we will have a brief time of question and answers and that the bookshop will be open later. I'll explain more. We have just tonight a 10% discount on some books for you, so you'll want to take advantage of that. But I don't want to take up any more time. I want to give the podium to Eric Patterson. Please welcome him. Well, my thanks, and I know for Mark as well, to Crystal and David, the directors here of the Wade Center, and for this uh, wonderful audience that we have tonight to talk about C.S. Lewis and war. And that title, The Odious Necessity, actually comes from... Green light. Uh, that title, The Odious Necessity, actually comes from a Lewis writing, hence the title. Uh, what we're going to do tonight, actually, I think we're going to have longer than just a very brief chance for you to have questions and comments. Um, we're going to be, we're going to give you a chance to participate. But my part of the presentation is going to look at C.S. Lewis and in specific his involvement as a soldier and as an author and a speaker during the First and Second World Wars. And then I'm going to hand it to Mark who's going to talk more about the way that C.S. Lewis talked about what we call Christian just war thinking in Lewis's scholarship. And of course, during World War II, you see this photo, Lewis went around to uh, Royal Air Force bases giving speeches about morality, about fighting for what's right, about the meaning of the war, how to understand World War II, and the, that there was meaning in, in self-defense of one's country and fighting for justice on the world stage. So, many of you know C.S. Lewis, born 1898, born in Ireland, and being Irish, he was not eligible for conscription into the British military once World War I started. He gets to Oxford as a student in the summer of 1917, and like many men of his generation, essentially immediately volunteered joining the officer training corps. And by November of that year, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on his 19th birthday, he deployed to the front in France. Uh, a young 19-year-old second lieutenant uh, gets to this You've seen the images of this incredible battle zone, what it's like. Uh, the photo here, actually Lewis is in the photo on your right. This head right here, that nose, <laughs> this suspender, this left shoulder, that's C.S. Lewis um, with, these, with these young men from Oxford. Shortly after getting to the front, he contracts trench fever. He spends three weeks in a hospital uh, uh, rehabilitating. While he's there, he reads G.K. Chesterton. And if you know from his biography, Surprise from Joy, what, what Lewis later says is that was one of those little, those little moments, those little things pushing him over time in the direction of how he later found faith in Christ. He goes back to the front. He's there for the Battle of the Somme. And, um, and during this time as a young, a young uh, lieutenant, he is, in a sense, mentored by an older man, a sergeant, who he tells us later had a very 
big impact on him because that, that was a real leader, someone who understood the motivations of young men. And um, on, a, on a fateful day in 1918, a shell came in, killed the man that he was, the sergeant, the man he was standing next to, and seriously wounded C.S. Lewis, leaving him with shrapnel in his leg, his arm, in his ribs, and puncturing his left lung. And so the war was over for Lewis, and he convalesced those last six weeks or so of the war um, in an army hospital. The armistice, as you know, happens in November of 1918, and he's finally discharged from the hospital at the end of December 1918. We know that many of Lewis's friends passed away in the war and that it was a destructive conflict. And Lewis did not have a Christian uh, perspective at this time. He was an atheist. But what's interesting is, is that just a few months after the war, May of 1919, he publishes a book called Spirits in Bondage. And Lewis, he, he, he wanted to be a poet, actually. He thought he was going to be a poet. And this is a book of poetry and I've put a, a, a part of one of the poems here, and I'll show you another one in a second. What you'll notice is this. Lewis, who claims to be an atheist, after seeing the destruction of the trench warfare of the war and losing friends to the war and knowing how many young men had sacrificed, how many families had lost, instead of saying, oh, there's no God, he points his fist at heaven and says, basically, how dare you do this to us? How dare you let this happen? You see it here. Thou art not Lord while there are men on earth. In other words, if we're going to be this destructive, you do not have control over the situation. And look at the top of this. Let us curse our master ere we die. For all our hopes in endless ruin lie. The good is dead. Let us curse God most high. So Lewis, despite being an atheist, knew that there was right and wrong. He knew that there was good. He knew that there was beauty. He knew that there was virtue. And he cursed God for allowing this destruction. Here's another poem uh, from Spirits in Bondage. Again, early 1919. And remember, this is the period where Woodrow Wilson is in Paris, uh, on the one hand, trying to, to negotiate what becomes the Versailles Treaty. There's hope for ending war. And on the other hand, Europe has experienced this terrible warfare. The Spanish flu is starting to spread around the world. There's this incredible loss of life. There's the uncertainty because of the Russian Revolution the year before. The world is really in turmoil. And this is how Lewis responds. Look at the end of this. Uh, and lifted up my voice to God, thinking that he could hear the curse wherewith I cursed him because the good was dead. He cared not for our virtues, our little hopes and fears. And this sounds so much like Lewis, doesn't it? Ah, oh, sweet if man could cheat him. If you could flee away into some other country in the rosy west to hide and then what a, what a bitter ending from the rankling hate of God and the outworn world's decay. And so Lewis does not write voluminously in an autobiographical sense about his war experience. We don't have thousands of letters from him on this, many of his letters from this time. They're just normal letters. Hey, here's what I read. What are you reading? What's going on at home? Those types of things. But nonetheless, you can see he had a direct experience for over a year on the Western Front and he leaves the war uh, more confirmed than ever in his atheism. Well, you know the story. Uh, sometime in 1931, he becomes a Christian. He finally surrenders to Christ. And during the 1930s, as he's maturing as a Christian and beginning to write on a variety of topics, Hitler rises to power. And in September of 1939, World War II starts. So Lewis volunteers. He goes to the army and he says, I, I volunteer. Maybe you could use me as an instructor. Now, they, they usually say no to kind of dumpy college professors <laughs> who are 41 years old. And they said no to Lewis. So what does he do? He joins the Home Guard. And we often kind of laugh about the Home Guard. Guys like this, right? They're, they're the has-beens of World War I. And what do they do? In his case, on Saturday nights and early Sunday mornings, he and a couple of other guys would go around the outskirts of Oxford with a flashlight and a shotgun just in case they found something. And it, and it sounds a bit ridiculous until you realize, if you think back, no, there was, a, there was a very direct threat of sabotage and of spying by Germans who had lived in the UK their entire lives, who could speak perfect English, 
because Oxford was a center of scientific learning. It was a place where cryptography was going on. We've seen this in movies recently. And so actually the Home Guard had a role to play, an actual defense role to play. And you know, these guys are getting out of bed, trying to stay vigilant, walking around the city at night, uh, providing a, a level of security that, that otherwise we wouldn't have had there. Lewis also brought children evacuees into his own home. So just like the Pevensey children in the Chronicles of Narnia who go and stay with the professor, and it all starts there with the wardrobe. By the way, the wardrobe is in that other room. Um, the, just like it starts there, uh, Lewis himself invites these children into their home and takes care of them. And then during the war, we have letters, we have his academic writings and a variety of other things in which he reflects on some of the nature of this war. Let me mention just three of them very briefly and then turn over to Mark. First, we're all familiar with mere Christianity, but much of that began as BBC radio broadcasts in 1942 and 1943. And you may not recall, but there's an entire section in there on how do I love my enemies, including in wartime. And he specifically talks about how do we do forgiveness. It's easy to say, oh, Christians, you ought to forgive. And he says, yeah, but what if you were a Jew or a Pole in 1942 who'd been invaded by the Nazis? Could you really forgive? What, what does it mean to love your neighbor? Two other things that he does during this time. So in October of 1939, Lewis gives a speech to students in Oxford. It's called Learning in Wartime. Now it's a long essay today in a book called The Weight of Glory. So I'm only gonna, I'm just gonna cherry pick a little bit. But in this book, or in this long essay, which has at least five different arguments in it, I think, he, he asks the students this question, he says, the war's been going on for six weeks, and here you are in college. You know what the last war was like, so you're probably asking yourselves, should I really even start a college degree when I probably won't be able to f finish it? That's learning in wartime. And his answer is, let's step back for a second, and let's talk about what does it mean to be a Christian who has a vocation? God has put you here in this time, so whatever your hand findeth to do, that's what you're supposed to be doing with all your might. And he walks them through kind of a Christian way of thinking about vocation. And then he talks about, as you see here, about, first of all, we have a duty to help others. But notice in the bottom of this quote, he also helps us have a rightful sense of Christian patriotism. And he talks about this as well in The Four Loves. And that is, it's appropriate to give your life for your country. It's appropriate to give your life for your fellow man. Or in other words, to, to die as you're trying to, to help someone. But should you really live your life for a political party or an ideology or for the government? And, and his answer is, that's a kind of idolatry because that's what belongs to God. And so Lewis helps in this essay think about justice and think about security and what peace really means. Six months later, at some point in 1940, he addresses a, a group of students on the, a group of pacifists in Oxford on this topic, why I'm not a pacifist. And in this, um, he talks about a number of things. He talks about there's no injunction in the New Testament against military or government service, as you see in the quote on your left. And in one of his most memorable passages, in, when he's talking about the Sermon on the Mount, he basically says, listen, the people who are sitting there listening to Jesus and he says, turn the other cheek. None of them thought that what that meant was just stand back and let a murderer do his business. He didn't think that. Look at Lewis's words. That if a homicidal maniac attempting to murder a third party tried to knock me out of the way, that I must stand aside and let him get his victim? Of course not. And Lewis helps us to understand that that ethic is really about forgiveness among citizens, you know, people who are rubbing each other the wrong way in daily village life. Well, I'm not a pacifist has a lot to say about thinking about justice and about self-defense and protecting those who are weaker than you are. Notice this, and I think it's a really, really beautiful thing. Lewis critiques those who wanna have idealistic, utopian, grand plans that often keep them far from reality. And he, and he says, I think the art of life consists in tackling each immediate evil as well as we can. How? By wise policy, to render one particular campaign shorter by strength and skill or less terrible by mercy to the conquered is more useful than all the universal 
proposals for peace that have ever been made. And again, he, he focuses our attention on what are the practical things that we can be done. We live in a fallen world. How do we mitigate evil? Well, let me just conclude by saying that the Christian just war tradition was assumed throughout Lewis's work. So our book project looks at his letters, his diaries, his sermons, his apologetic works, his nonfiction, particular scholarship. You know, he wrote scholarly work on King Arthur and on his, of course, on his fiction like this uh, space trilogy in Narnia. The just war tradition really asks three big questions. When is it moral to go to war or to really to employ force? And then second, once that decision is made by proper authorities acting on a just cause with right intentions, then what are the restraints? What are the limits for vigorous prosecution to win and at the same time restraining destruction? And then the third question over time is, so what does that, what does peace look like? The just war tradition has always said that the goal or the objective is peace. What are the steps towards order and justice and conciliation that will get us there? I'm gonna turn over to Mark to talk about some of these things, and in particular, how C.S. Lewis viewed the just warrior. Mark. Yeah, all right. Uh, Crystal said that I had some similar similarities with C.S. Lewis. In our early life, we were both atheists. There's one other big similarity that we didn't talk about. We were both apparently really bad at math. All right? Both Lewis and I agree that there are three kinds of people in the world, those who are good at math and those who are not. All right, we're going to make a quick pivot. I'm going to go into Lewis's general view of war by turning to his friend and drinking buddy J.R.R. Tolkien. Can I say drinking buddy at Wheaton College? Is that okay? Okay. Here's a quote. Who's it from? I do not slay man or beast needlessly, and not gladly even when it is needed. War must be, while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour all. But I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend. So says Faramir, thank you, captain of Gondor, thereby intersecting love with the cataclysm of war. And indeed, Faramir presses the claim even further, war can be an expression of love. Okay, this is Louisian all the way through. Everything that follows in this talk will follow from the fact that the Christian ethical life has as its central commitment this dominical command to love. Now, this love command is not an option. It's an absolute mandate. But because of the conditions of this world and the human soul, it is not always clear precisely how it is that we are to love. For instance, how do we love one neighbor when he is unjustly kicking apart the face of another neighbor, who we are also called to love? It doesn't matter that this first neighbor, let's call him the enemy neighbor, refuses to stop his kicking and our victim neighbor is unable to defend himself. We're not let off, we're not let off the hook. We are still called to love them both. Nor is it sufficient to say, okay, I'm gonna love the victim neighbor now, and I'll love the enemy neighbor later, you know, after the smoke is cleared. Nope, I am to love both of them now in this moment. This is clear, or ought to be clear. But it's also clear that I cannot love both of them in this exact moment, in exactly the same way. But I am to love them. Lewis stood in the Augustinian stream of Christian realism. He drew on a long line of Christian thinkers who since the beginning of the church brought together the best of Greco-Roman and Hebraic teaching to provide resources for Christian reflection on the use of force. And from within this tradition, Lewis provides guidance in how we are to love in conflict situations, both our enemy neighbor as well as our innocent neighbor. Now the second obligation I don't think is too difficult. Right, the idea that force, even lethal force, deployed for the rescue of the victim neighbor can be consistent with love, uh, even an expression of love, should be self-evident. But how can lethal force also be consistent with or even expression of love for the enemy neighbor from whom we are rescuing the victim neighbor? This might be a bit less clear. Can we really love our enemy to death? 
let's go to a familiar land to explore this. You'll remember the scene. In the dead of night, young Caspian, future king of Narnia, stands with his tutor, Cornelius, atop the central tower in the great castle at the center of the Narnian realm. They've come to witness the conjunction of two planets, Tarva, the lord of victory, and Alambil, the lady of peace. Such a meeting, Cornelius instructs his pupil, has not happened for 200 years, and it portends some great fortune for Narnia. This fortune, we soon learn, involves Caspian coming into his birthright to command an insurrection of dwarves and talking beasts in the great war of deliverance that delivers Narnia, or that liberates Narnia, from the unlawful rule of his evil uncle, Miraz. Now, it's popularly assumed that Tarva and Alambil, the planets that they were watching come into conjunction, signify the Narnian versions of Venus and Mars. And this would serve a great purpose for me um, in my claim throughout this talk that Venus and Mars, love and war, must come together in Christian morality if we are to move faithfully through this world. But alas, this doesn't seem to be the case. So in planet Narnia, the seven heavens in the imagination of C.S. Lewis, Narnia and Wade Center friend Michael Ward points out that on several occasions we're told that the Narnian morning star, which in our world is Venus, is in Narnia um, called Erever, not Alambil. So this isn't a conjunction apparently of Venus and Mars. Instead, Ward posits, the conjunction that Caspian observes is meant to be the coming together of two aspects of the martial influence alone. He says this, Mars is not only a fighting machine, he has a more pacific, life-giving dimension too. So Mars was originally a springtime god of vegetation and fertility, things like this. Under the name Mars Silvanus, his functions were rustic. He dwelt in forests and mountains, and he cared for cattle. His warrior dimensions, Mars Gradivarius, came later, eventually superseding this less belligerent role. So you see this duality also in the Narnian Tower itself. Ward points out that on one side of the tower that Cornelius and Caspian have climbed, on one side is a, are the battlements, the crenellations, but on the other side of the, the tower, the unembattled side, you had a direct view of the castle gardens. So you see both these aspects in play. <clears throat> if you want, in the Q&A, I have a, an image that apparently hung in C.S. Lewis's Maudlin College room. And C.S. Lewis hated painting, self-confessedly, uh, but there's one painting that he apparently had in his office, and it's of Venus and Mars, and if you want to walk through how both the Venetian and the Martial in Martian influence affect, I think, his view of the just warrior, we can do that. So that's a tease. All right, in any case, whether through the influence of Venus or the two aspects of his own internal character, Lewis is Mars, and the Martial influence, or the Martial character that the Martian influence brings out in others is about much more than war and violence alone. For Lewis, the fullness of this complex martial character is best communicated, I hope to this audience, of course, by the chivalric ideal of the knight, the Christian in arms for the defense of a good cause, which Lewis called one of the great Christian ideas. This chivalric ideal, in turn, is best understood through the words addressed to the dead Lancelot, greatest of all the knights, in Mallory's Mort de Arthur, they write this, thou wert the meekest man that ever ate in hall among ladies, and thou wert the sternest knight to thy mortal foe. And on this, Lewis expounds this way. The important thing about this ideal is the double demand that it makes on human nature. The knight is a man of blood and iron, a man familiar with the sight of smashed faces and the ragged stumps of lopped off limbs. He's also a demure, almost a maiden-like guest in hall a gentle, modest, unobtrusive man. He is not a compromise or a happy mean between ferocity and meekness. He is fierce to the nth and meek to the nth. In this, Lewis is thoroughly Augustinian. Among much else, the Augustinian realist does not judge the martial nature, the belligerent dimension of human being, something to be merely overcome, recognizing instead that given the conditions of the world, martial power, including coercive justice, is a basic, even salutary, property of political life. However, because human beings are motivated both by love and kindness, as well as selfishness and cruelty, the use of force must be viewed with skepticism. 
and deployed within carefully prescribed constraints. And this recognition is exemplified in the Christian moral framework that you've already heard called the just war tradition, which states that wars may be justly fought only when a sovereign authority over whom there is no one greater charge with the care of the political community determines in the last resort and with the aim of peace that discriminate and proportionate force is necessary to retribute a sufficiently grave evil, to take back what has been wrongly taken, or to protect the innocent. In such cases, and only such, war may be required to restore order, justice, and therefore, hopefully, peace and conciliation. These are not trifles. These are political goods without which no other political good can long endure. This, then, is the salient connection. The Pacific life-giving functions of Mars share the same project as his martial aspect. In the Christian life, this is exemplified in the idea that love qualifies but does not eradicate war. This points, as another Narnian friend once insisted, to the existence or possible existence of a certain kind of self, one that is strong enough to resist the lure of seductive, violent enthusiasms, and one bound by and laced through with a sense of responsibility and accountability. This is to say that the chivalric ideal was always something more than merely literary artifact. Now, writing in the beginning of World War II, Lewis found that the chivalric ideal was terribly relevant. It may or may not be practicable, he said. The Middle Ages notoriously failed to obey it, but it is certainly practical. Practical is the fact that men in desert must find water or die. The key, he said, was in remembering that the night is a work of not of nature, but of art, of that art which has human beings instead of canvas or marble for its medium. So chivalry attempted to bring together two things that since the fall of humanity, Lewis suggested, have no natural tendency to gravitate toward one another. It teaches humility and forbearance to the great warrior, because everyone knew by experience how much he usually needed the lesson, and it demands valor of the urbane and modest man, because everyone knew that it was likely as not to be a milksop. If you don't know what a milksop is, we can ask the older people in the Q&A. <laughs> the danger, as Lewis saw it, was that if we cannot produce Lancelots, then humanity falls into two sections. Those who can deal in blood and iron, but know nothing about mercy, and kill men as they cry for quarter, and those who are meek in hall, but useless in battle. That's the hopeless choice. Either the implacable Achilles, uh, who at his worst captured and killed now helpless men at his leisure, or Casper Milk Toast, which also takes us a little ways back. This was the H.T. Webster cartoon anti-hero who was a spineless coward standing up to nothing. All right, those are the two alternatives in Lewis's mind. Against both Achilles and Milk Toast, Lewis gives us such figures as Reepicheep, the High Mouse of Narnia, arguably the most courageous, most devout follower of Aslan in all the Narnian tales. This is T-A-L-E-S, not T-A-I-L-S. It's Reepicheep who most plainly displays the marbling of ferocity and meekness that Lewis calls for in the night. Reep constantly champions the courageous defense of the innocent, and yet is most eager to journey to Aslan's country where he will no longer need arms. Um, so you'll recall just before he sails to the utter east, he bids farewell to Edmund and Lucy and he gives up his sword. You remember this scene? And he gives it up in a most Arthurian of ways. He chucks it across the water where it spins and lands hilt up. All right, just like Excalibur. The only time that Reap ever dispensed with his weapon is when he knew, or better and crucially, when he knew that others would no longer need it. One imagines Reap now in Aslan's country, maybe with a plowshare, tending a garden or making cheese. <laughs> meek. Time for a philological refresher. What is meek? So Lewis Lauds Mallory's description of Lancelot as meek. Now the term meek, I think, is sort of out of favor nowadays. Meek sounds weak, weak right? Very good, on cue. Hardly a quality worth cultivating, I would hope. Jesus, of course, paints a similarly perplexing picture when he assures us in the Sermon on the Mount that the meek are especially blessed 
for they will inherit the earth, which is wonderful because the meek, they never get anything, right? <laughs> and if you're laughing, I know what movies you watch, <laughs> right? Modern misunderstandings notwithstanding, there is nothing weak or spineless about the meek. And indeed, the sense from which both the chivalric and the inscripturated ideals draw their meaning is the term proas, uh, a word which was used, if sometimes indirectly, in ancient sources, such as Xenophon and Aristotle, to describe instances of power under submission, as in a war horse who has been trained for battle. All right? A war horse could weigh up to 2,000 pounds, could charge up to 30 miles an hour. Their task was to smash into enemy forces and scatter them. All right, these are the types of things they did. Um, they could obey the commands, they obeyed the commands of the one who held their reins. This is vitally important. They could bite, they could kick, they could strike, they could boff, they could become themselves deadly weapons. All right, all at the whim of the one who held the reins. So who holds the reins? This is always the crucial question. In this sense, meek is the best summary word for the way in which love qualifies, but does not abolish, the martial spirit and its lethal expression. Uh, in Aristotle, the philosopher casts meekness as a mean between irascibility, which is like wild, quick-temperedness on the one side, and then on the other, a spineless lack of spirit. Uh, in fact, reap arguably matures into meekness over the course of the Narnian stories. So you remember, he starts off rather bumptious, right? He's a moderately courageous. Um, even reckless. And then later, he shocks everyone in the voyage of the Dawn Treader, which is the best of the Narnian books, where he prudently <laughs> suggests, we could talk about it, where he prudently suggests that the Narnians stand down rather than attack the duffel pods and try and rescue Lucy. And why he decides this, I think, is absolutely fascinating. All right, but even with this important idea in hand, why does love just not abide? abolish the martial spirit. How can love and war ever really be compatible? Well, as I projected earlier, while it's obvious how war can be waged out of love in defense of one's threatened neighbor, it remains that the one who is doing the threatening is a neighbor as well. And the question is, how can we both love our enemy and kill him? So in the problem of pain, Lewis severs that when People think about love, they often confuse it with kindness, which he describes as the desire to see others happy. Not happy in this way or in that, but just happy. However, Lewis insists, love is something more stern and splendid than mere kindness. There is kindness in love, but love and kindness are not coterminous. And when kindness, in the sense given above, is separated from the other elements of love, it involves a certain fundamental indifference to its object, and even something like contempt for it. And Elie Wiesel, just as an aside, said that the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference, right? These are, if these are harsh notions, I suggest they're also reasonable. Let's go back to our consideration of meekness. It's particularly significant that meek should appear in the Sermon on the Mount. Meek, you'll recall, is listed among the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are presented as a cumulative character description, the constituent elements of which, the poor in spirit, the meek, those who mourn, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, and the peacemakers, roll together, each gathering one into the others, and so they form a, a, a comprehensive aggregate that is able to be recognized as a son of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, goes the final beatitude, for they will be called sons of God. And this is really saying something. In Semitic thought, sonship is used figuratively to signify the idea that a person shares the qualities, the nature of the fatherly figure being specified. So peacemakers bear the characteristics of God. So you'll further recall that the possession of each beatitudinal characteristic is conferred to be a blessing Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers, etc. Now, the term blessing in Christ's handling here also requires some nuance. In the Vulgate, the Latin for blessed can also be translated happiness. But as with uh, Lewis's rendering of kindness, happiness uh, doesn't point to 
just a gassy kind of subjective feeling, but rather to a concrete objective fact. Happiness has a peripatetic, an Aristotelian connotation. It points to the enjoyment of those conditions that allow human beings made in the image of God to flourish, to be that for which they were made. So it has an ends orientation. What were you made to be? Be that if you want to be happy, right? It's the only way. All right, so it requires, and happiness therefore requires a very specific moral ecosystem built both for body and soul. So Jesus and Lewis want us to be happy, uh, but both are pointing to a non-negotiable set of terms that will allow happiness to happen. Now, wonderful is the life uh, or the occasion in which both the objective fact of happiness and the subjective feeling of happiness align. But as with the, the earlier beatitude, in the kingdom's ecology, even those who mourn can be genuinely happy. All right, with happiness's objective end in view, we can extend its contrast with mere kindness. Kindness, Lewis warned, does not concern itself so much with whether its object becomes good or bad, only that it escapes suffering. But love, as Lewis asserts, would rather see its object suffer much than be happy and contemptible in estranging modes. The warfighter, like the surgeon or the dentist or the parent, knows that on occasion a hard thing has to be done to prevent the onset of an even harder thing. The surgeon also knows, as at least a just warrior ought also to know, that the hard thing is not sometimes simply necessary, but very often morally right, and therefore morally obligatory. It's clear to medical professionals that they are not performing lesser evils, but rather the greatest possible good. This should be, though it's admittedly harder, this should be equally clear to just warriors. This is, of course, risking sounding a bit too glib. While the doctor can know with certainty that the festering gangrene leg needs to be removed to heal the patient, and therefore the harm, and it is a harm, the harm that they do to the patient is justified. But to know without doubt that we are on the right on a battlefield is a claim to omniscience that we, of course, do not possess. And this is significant, for at the end of the day, with soldiering, unlike medicine, we may not simply have a hobbled patient whose life we saved by carving them, we may have a corpse. And the justifiability of making our neighbor into a corpse has to be proved. While the art of political judgment is a bit too complicated to fully address here, there are two things that I want to begin to close with. First, there isn't necessarily anything terribly sophisticated in judging acts of political evil. That we often try to make it all very complicated, most people know, at least at the scale of the actions of nations, when something evil is going on. We know this. Also, in standing effectively against such evils, most people know that love, in tandem with justice, is consistent with the idea that A deserves B for doing C. Second, while the moral warrior cannot claim omniscience, he can utilize prudence. Acting in the world requires employing the wisdom that one has, aided by reason, experience, and authority, which are the three ways that Lewis believed we can know anything, and in then doing the best one knows with the limited information at hand. This is just what the Just War Moral Framework is all about. It takes moral rules, it couples them with context, and it promotes the best responsive action that it can. Of course, not to act is also a action that requires some degree of justification, which shouldn't be forgotten. The just war framework harnesses reason because reason is necessary, not merely an intuition. Intuitions can run astray. One intuition increasingly prevalent in the West, even especially in the Christian West, Lewis suggested in his day, and I think this is increasingly true in our own, is the intuition that love is good and hatred bad, or as Lewis said, that helping is good and harming bad. But, Lewis continues, you cannot go from this intuition to a moral act until the intuition is qualified in some way. He writes, you cannot do simply good to simply man. You must do this good or that good to this or that man. And if you do this good, you can't at the same time do that. And if you do these to these men, 
you can also do it to those. So this reminds us of the dilemma above in which one neighbor is wrongly kicking apart the face of another neighbor and refuses to stop. So as already stated, while it is a Christian duty to love both the victim and the victimizer, we obviously cannot love both in precisely the same way in the same instance. Love or mercy for one neighbor may manifest in his defense and rescue. Love, even mercy, for the other in his correction. This context dependence is why Christian morality has sometimes been called an ethic without rules. This isn't meant to be absolute literal, but rather it's meant to remind us that most often the Christian rules are rather capacious and their expression depends on circumstances. And before that makes all of us panic, here's the example. I suggested earlier that to love is an absolute mandate, it's an absolute rule. But what does to love mean in a given situation? To answer, answer that, not only do you need to know what love actually is before you can act, you need to have an appreciation for the circumstances at hand and then, and then to reason what love would look like given the present context. For Lewis, that the condemnation, punishment, and possible killing of an enemy can be an act of love can only be understood by remembering that as Christians, we believe that the human soul is eternal. Therefore, as Lewis wrote, what really matters is those little marks or twists on the central inside part of the soul, which are to turn it in the long run into a heavenly or a hellish creature. So in this, Lewis is fully aligned with both the just war and the chivalric traditions. Each come from a Thomistic hinterland in which it is asserted that though unchecked wrongdoing may lead to the happiness of sinners, it is a false macabre parody of happiness. Therefore, when restraining a wrongdoer by forcing him to stop, by deterring him from resuming, and ideally by provoking him to think again and change his aggressive ways, we work toward the promotion of the only possibility for his true flourishing. This belongs to his own good, even if it should cost him his very life, because this is the only way to be happy. However jarring that might be to current sensibilities, Lewis assures us that this is what is meant in the Bible by loving our enemy, wishing his good, not feeling fond of him, nor saying he is nice when he is not. Of course, love is at work in our disposition towards those hard tasks, and Lewis therefore rightly insists, even while we kill, we must try to feel about the enemy as we feel about ourselves, to wish he were not bad, to hope that he may, in this world or another, be cured. In fact, to wish his good. This, too, is what used to be called love. The night, Lewis insisted, that marbling together of what in fallen humanity are those contrasting dispositions, greatness and goodness, justice and love, found in the conjunction of Mars and Venus, is the one hope in the world. Such a union, he insisted, does not come easy in the best of times. In less optimum days, the task is all but impossible. Such sentiments, I suspect, are reliably present only in a culture that still acknowledges her Greco-Roman and Hebraic patrimony, an inheritance that is increasingly disclaimed. We no longer believe in the foundations in which our best beliefs are anchored. And as we abandon ourselves, the just war tradition and the chivalric impetus that Lewis championed are increasingly divorced by those who dismiss the insertion of love into power politics as mere or weak sentimentality, or more prevalently by those who regard the combative side of man's nature as simply pure atavistic evil. Those same tawdry alternatives of either brutality or softness were present in Lewis's day as well. They were insufficient then, they are insufficient now. As Lewis warned, quote, the ideal embodied in Lancelot is the only possible escape from a, a world divided between wolves who do not understand and sheep who cannot defend the things that make life desirable, end of quote. So in a world such as our own, Lewis's closing comments and his reflection on the necessity of chivalry are ominous. There was, he wrote, to be sure, a rumor in the last century that wolves would gradually become extinct by some natural selection. But 
this seems to have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> All right, thank you. We are going to set up some chairs so that our speakers can sit and take questions. As we're setting them up, if you needed to slip out to use the restroom, you may, but we'll start the questions quite quickly. But as the setup is occurring, I want to tell you a little bit more about this special 10% discount tonight. After the question and answer, um, session, you can go to the front of the building and under the windows we have a display of books by and about C.S. Lewis and war. So the books that were mentioned by both of our speakers like The Four Loves, um, Learning in Wartime which is in the Weight of Glory, The Problem of Pain, they are there and I really want to draw your attention to a book a new book there on Lewis's brother, Warney, who was career military. And the name of the book is Inkling, Historian, Soldier, and Brother. So uh, this conversation about Lewis thinking of war, his brother was career. And in fact, if you go to look at the wardrobe after this, we have Warney's military jacket. And I always tell people, you know, rub it. There might be some C.S. Lewis DNA on it. <laughs> also, <laughs> under the... Oh, that sounds so wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> also on the table for 10% discount is Dr. David Downing's novel called Looking for the King, which is about a young skeptic during World War II who goes to England and meet C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, who persuade him towards making a decision for Christ. It's a very interesting novel. It's already been optioned in Hollywood. So those just tonight are the ones just under the windows there are available for a 10% discount. And now David, the author of that novel, will be passing the the this mic around so that just raise your hand if you have a question for our speakers. Or a rebuke or a funny story. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. When you called it odious necessity, I thought it was going to be about doing your taxes. So. <laughs> so we learned tonight that uh, C.S. Lewis, you know, he was uh, in the psalm and it seems that his, uh, you know, his atheism was more or less hardened uh, during that time. But uh, what I'd like to ask you is about the uh, applicability or the extension of his chivalric ideal, uh, which was formed, you know, uh, he had a, you said he was an infantry officer, so he had a rifle platoon there uh, with, you know, fixed bayonets and infield rifles. Uh, how would how would Lewis uh, how would his chivalric ideal extend to uh, the modern battle space where emotional and physical distance between combatants uh, has been uh, lengthened to such a degree uh, with like the extension of uh, you know air uh, air superior or air superiority and uh, space power. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'll give one part of an answer to this. And we, we often, you're right, that we often think about that, well, is the chivalric ideal just two people who are kind of fighting in hand-to-hand -hand combat, that medieval ideal, and there's that noblesse oblige between the two of them, right? They don't kill one another usually. One surrenders after being beaten. Um, and sh is that what we apply in every case? And so the, the natural conundrum of modern warfare is this distance that we can shoot a missile so far that the person shooting it has no kind of human connection to the enemy combatant. And, and that is a legitimate thing, but it, it, it's actually not entirely a, a new issue because when we think about the just warrior, we're thinking about people who are in leadership making a decision to send warriors. And so they're, 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 the, if you go just two or three ranks up the chain, 
we've always had the political leader or the flag officer saying, I'm sending these people to go do some battle that's actually quite far from me. And Lewis actually has a moment at the end of the first book in the Narnia series, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that I think is a very interesting one. So Edmund, who has turned from being bad to being good, is wounded on the battlefield. Do you remember this? So it's at the end of this great battle, and, and Edmund is wounded. And Lucy, his sister, who's a queen of Narnia, that's her vocational role, has this cordial that with a healing balm in it. And so she goes to Edmund and she you know, puts a drop on him and he starts to recover. And Aslan gently reminds her that there are other people who need to be healed. And Lucy unbelievably says to Aslan, crossly, I think is the word that Lewis uses, just wait a second, I need to, you know, I need to check on my brother. And Aslan kind of growls and says, must anyone else die because of him? Now, it really struck me. I know it's, it's not exactly, but Lucy's vocation is to serve as a queen and to making decisions for, for, for her, her troops that are actually faceless and nameless to her and probably wounded enemy combatants as well. And the ethic is that she is supposed to be acting in that vocation um, as a warrior and, and as a healer in her political role, despite the fact that they are nameless, faceless, far away from her. And so she still has a responsibility to act, to act morally, to act justly in her role. And I think that what that tells us today is that even in modern, even in the modern battle space, we have to be recognizing in our training, in the way that we pr prepare our leaders, that the enemy combatants are still flesh and blood human beings, even if they're faceless and nameless, whether it's to a cybersecurity person or a drone operator or whatever the like is. And, that, and that's incumbent on us as a society and our institutions of what we call professional military education, PME, to train that down the ranks. The, the only thing I would add too, you know, it, it, we saw it in the older battlefields with, with archery, and, then, and they were rebuked for the, the, you know, the reasons behind your question, maybe like, you know, like there's more mobility and that you're killing from a distance. So it's an old, older problem. Um, I think there's a certain irony in history, particularly with, with the so-called drone operators or you know, remote piloted aircraft, um, where the, the, not only is there, I mean, well, I mean the distance is now you know, multiple thousands of miles, right? People might be in a, um, in a skiff in, in Nevada um, fighting battles, right? And then after their shift is over, they might have smoked someone in the battle, and then they go home, pick up milk on the way, maybe coaches get soccer game, um, have dinner with his family, make love to his wife, and then go back and kill people the next day. And that kind of deployment, redeployment cycle is, is unlike anything we've ever had before. Um, the irony is that as the technology of things like the RPA is, improves, uh, whatever the distance, the intimacy with which these people are doing their job is increased. Um, so it's all classified, but the, you know the, 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 the optical optic ball that's on these these RPAs, these remote piloted aircraft, is so exquisite they could read newspaper from you know significant heights. Um, they have incredible loiter time; they can hover over a target for a long time, which is good because they can identify um, who it is that they're they're stalking. And so you could end up with scenarios in which somebody has, has hovered over a target for a, for a long period of time in order to prove identity or to verify hostility. Um, they get the call to pull the trigger, they pull the trigger. Um, the optics are so good that you can see the, the projectile hit. You can see what you've now done to the person. Um, sometimes if it's not a clean kill, you see the person bleed out. Uh, if you're just at the beginning of your shift, you, you might have time to, to stick around and wait to see who collects the body.
very much for your talks. They were great. Uh, I wondered if uh, you might reflect on a passage in a different Lewis series in Perlandra when Ransom is debating with himself, guided by the spirit, about how he can stop the unman. And he decides it's not by providing a good example or by um, going home and writing a book about it. He has to physically stop mm -hmm. him, even though in his heart he thinks it, he won't survive it. Uh, and that debate that he goes through in considering that, that, that this is the physical act he has to do. Uh, any reflections or ideas on that, or does it develop further the themes you've been talking about? Yeah. Thank you. And he uses the word hate, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting, um, maybe I just, you asked to reflect, so I'm gonna reflect um, <laughs> rather than answer. Uh, I just reread that passage in the last week. And uh, what struck me is that Ransom, if I'm not mistaken, Lewis scholars tell me, um, he, he uses the word hate for the direction of his energy towards the unman because the unman is so evil and that he has to uh, direct his, his, all of his strength towards defeating this entity. I mean, perhaps that's a special example because the unman, who used to be Weston, Weston has given right. up his soul. Right, he's, so. he's an evil entity, right? And, but this, this comes to this idea of there really is a difference between righteous indignation and vengeance. And Lewis talks about this in other places. He talks about it in his reflections on the Psalms. He talks about it in the Four Loves and other places. And it really is actually important when we're thinking about the use of force. And that is, is that there is a difference between using force towards justice, towards security, based on righteous indignation. That's a form of anger but it is not hate. It is not vengeance. It is not bitterness. So uh, a motivation to use force to stop evil uh, is, is, is perfectly appropriate in Lewis. And that is different than a vengeful, bitter hatred, which is a different type, a, a different type of anger that is allowed to fan into wrath. And, and I, I think you see, you see in that a couple things. Uh, you see the just war uh, demand for last resort, where he, he goes through the options, he, he, he weighs whether or not there's anything else he can do to stop this threat. Um, so there's a hesitance, there's not an eagerness to have to, to get to fight better, a willingness if you have to fight, those are different. Um, the other thing that I think is great is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been suggesting that there is a, a marveling in Lewis of uh, uh, the Venusian or the, the, you know, the Venus and the Martian, the Mars uh, characteristics into the Just Warrior. Um, the first book in the series, Out of the Silent Planet, you know, Weston appears in that, but Weston doesn't get killed in that book, right? He gets killed in the second book. But where does the first book take place? What is the planet? Mars. On Mars, Weston is shown mercy, right? And given a, given a reprieve. What planet is he killed on? Okay, I don't think that's accidental. I think that's saying that, look, these dispositions are marbled together, and both, both are present at the same time. So it's just a little pet theory. Hi. Um, two questions, kind of um, going off what you've been talking about, righteous indignation, when is it right? Did Lewis have any thoughts on Bonhoeffer? Uh, plot, uh, part of the plot to kill, assassinate Adolf Hitler. Were there any thoughts on that? Um, whether right or wrong, or did, did he have any thoughts on that? And secondly, when you made uh, the thought of the just war being archaic and old fashioned today in the context, just to comment, your comment on this, because as I think about that, I actually think a just war is relatively new. It's might for right, I think we're actually going back and being archaic because now if we take that away, isn't it might is right, which takes us back to Assyria and pagan culture. So I, I want you to kind of comment on that too because I actually think that's new and we're going back to the old mm. stuff. Just, just thoughts on that. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'll say a couple things real quick. Um, on the question about Bonhoeffer, I would defer to our archivists. Um, they will probably know. 
Um, I've heard an anecdote, I, I, I don't know where it is, it's probably in a letter or something, where Lewis met somebody who said that he had met Hitler. And Lewis said, and I think it was a priest or somebody that, that had met Hitler. And Lewis was, you know, sort of uh, curious and said, you know, what did he look like? Right? And the priest said, well, like anyone, like Christ. Right? Um, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, on this question of, of whether or not just war takes us all the way back or is archaic itself, I, th I, think that, I, th I love how you put that, and I think that's right. Um, there is a push nowadays to say that the just war tradition is obsolete. There's probably been a push ever since just war first started being talk about, talked about to suggest that it was obsolete. Um, nowadays, I think we see the charge coming from one of at least two places. And by the time I'm done, I told you I was bad at math, there might be three. Um, one of them is maybe from the idealists who say, ah, you know, just war is just a cover for doing whatever the heck you want, mm -hmm. right? It's always been that. It's just a, a self-justifying charade. Um, and the other quarter that it comes from, I think, are the realists who say this is silliness. This idea of justified or just war, it's just war. It's only war, right? Um, and morality doesn't play a part. Uh, I love their coffee, but Black Rifle Coffee Company, I don't know if this is big in Wheaton, I live in Annapolis, everybody has Black Rifle Coffee Company t-shirts, it's veteran owned, etc. Um, they have a podcast and it's usually really good. Um, unfortunately, they had a podcast some time back um, with, I, I think it was the guy who got into all sorts of trouble because he was going against some of the COVID protocols while in uniform in his office. Um, I didn't mind his diatribe, he shouldn't have done it in uniform in his office, that's an aside. Uh, but they're complaining, um, they're vet, uh, what's the word, kvetching over the uh, just war tradition. And they start just building off each other and they're saying, yeah, just war, that's dumb. It's just win theory, which is just, you know, dumb. Um, <laughs> that's as academic a response as I could possibly have to that. So it's being, being challenged from all sorts of quarters, both left and right, and conservative, liberal, realist, idealist, all of it. Got a question for you guys. Oh, no. Here we go. I just answered the question that you might have asked. Wheaton professors. Yeah. yeah, here we go. So clearly, just war is an ancient concept that applies to blood and guts and steel and people on the battlefield. I'd like your, to hear your thoughts about cyber war. Hmm. Because we have this new type of war in which people are sitting behind a bank of computers pushing buttons. Yep. and people don't necessarily die as a result of their action. Systems get shut down, bad things happen, but people don't die. So to what extent, if any, does just war apply in the cybercom uh, world? Yeah. So the, I'll make a few comments. One distinction that's very helpful in the just war tradition is to think about the difference between force and violence. And force is restrained it's in the hands of legitimate authority. It has a purpose towards justice, peace, and security. And violence is unrestrained. It's usually unlawful, or it's, it's a lawful authority, but misusing its power. Uh, violence is usually vindictive or vengeful or bitter. And it might sound like I'm making a little semantic difference, but if you really think about the difference, I mean, you can tell the difference between loving discipline and beating a child. And you can tell the difference between even the use of lethal force by law enforcement to save the woman or to save the child, to stop the murder. And it's totally different than police brutality, right? And the same thing happens at the next level. And so the just war tradition when it comes to, uh, we, we've always had espionage, we've always had spying, we've had sabotage. I mean, there's a whole, a whole variety of, of acts of war that maybe sink a ship but don't kill anyone because it happens in the middle of the night or that targets just an individual or targets the economic system, right? By moving the channel of a river or blowing up a bank or, I mean, there's just a whole agricultural warfare which we've always had. And so one way to be thinking about this when we think about cyber is to distinguish, you know, where those limits are and what, and, and second is, do we have authorities? Do we have generals and others who are setting the terms for what's the appropriate use of cyber warfare and what those limits are. So for instance, there w we would think, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go out of your way as a first step in battle to wipe out all the civilians in a city, 
You'd never start there, right? Well, if you wipe out their livelihood, if you take out their dams, if you take out their hydroelectric, if you blow up their hospitals because you send a, a, a electronic virus in there, we want leaders who are making the decisions based on those same just war criteria, even if it's in that um, kind of ephemeral cyberspace and doing it because they're using legitimate acts of force with a purpose towards winning the war and not vindictively hurting civilians, trying to put a country back into the fifth century, trying to knock out their records in their banking system so that they're emasculated financially forever, et cetera. And I think that that's where we start is on the, is on the training side. Do you have a follow-up on that? Just go right ahead if you do. Uh, I'll, I'll beg patience. I know that you said it was just a semantics argument, but I'll, I'll well, venture. Well, I think it's an important one. I'll, yeah. I'll venture to disagree on the use of uh, violence pejoratively. Yeah. Uh, you know, Lucy in uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, she asks uh, a stand, I, I can't remember who she asks, but she, she asks if Aslan is a safe line. And uh, I believe the answer is something, uh, uh, by no means is he safe. He's a very dangerous lion, yeah. right? Uh, but he is good. And I think that Aslan is dangerous because he is capable of great violence. Mm -hmm. Violence is neutral. Uh, it, it can be used for good or it can be used for evil, right? Mm -hmm. Money is, is neutral. It can be used for good or it can be used for evil. So I, I, I think that it's... Uh, uh, something uh, that the word violence isn't something that should be yielded uh, just for people who would use it uh, to uh, uh, put forth a negative agenda, but it's something that could be manifested uh, by people who would use it to, uh, you know, defend their homes or, you know, defend the country or defend the church, uh, even. Uh, you know, but that's all, uh, sure. and I'm open to your comments yeah. on that. I just simply say that. Um, I do think making a distinction is important. You're right, so a sword laying right there is a neutral instrument in a lot of ways. So what the just war tradition helps us with, and that's why I think it's important to try to distinguish even massive, overwhelming, lethal force from violence is, is this. The just war tradition starts with proper authorities acting on a just cause with right intention. And so that sword that we have there, that weapon, that tool, it's just a tool, a knife is just a tool, et cetera. The, is it wielded by, or an agent under authority, is it acting on a just cause? And, and Augustine said, what are, what are the types of just causes? Righting the past wrong, punishing wrongdoers, um, preventing more wrongdoing, right? Kind of basic things. And then acting on with right intention. And again, that intention is, there's a, there's a difference in right intention when we're acting out of neighbor love and love of country versus hatred, bitterness, greed, etc. cetera. Uh, in fact, Augustine says that's the real evil in war. That's the real evil, hatred, bitterness, etc. So the distinction I'm making is, I actually think that we're agreeing on like the substance, but I'm, I'm distinguishing for our, for, so that we have a language to use there really is a, because here's what happens. People will say, well, George Washington, wasn't he a terrorist? And, and the answer is, well, no, not really. He was under proper authority. He was under the constitutional convention. He was under the intermediate authority of the colonies. He fought by the laws of war. They did fight unconventionally, but they didn't go and kill women and children or things like that. He didn't act in a terroristic fashion. He didn't, for instance, assassinate political leaders or any of those types of things. And he didn't act out of hatred at any time. And so this distinction, I mean, it actually is very, very practical things in the kind of work that we do because we'll often have that 19-year-old student say, uh, isn't one man's freedom fighter another man's terrorist? Isn't George Washington the same as Osama bin Laden? Mm -hmm. And when you ask the question, authority, just cause, right intention, you just get a very different answer, and, and hence, the, at least for our work, distinguishing force from violence. That's, that, mm -hmm. that's why. It's kind of a specialist thing. But, but you can see how it's important when you think about, for instance, the American War for Independence, or you can see about why it's important, the difference between a legitimate combatant operating under law and authority um, versus vindictive, hateful violence. When, when I use the term, I'll often make this distinction. Um, if I'm in a mixed or military crowd, I'll retract from 
you know, demanding. Right. Yeah. Because the demanding the uh, the distinction between the two, because warfighters use the term, but they qualify it. It's usually the controlled application of violence, yeah. right? Yeah. To distinct, they're making that distinction. So I offer the distinction, and then I'll retract, and it's not a hill that yeah. I'll die on. If I if I could just touch briefly on on Dr. Iglesias question. Um, one of the reasons why I think just war still applies to cyber um, is the same reason I think it applies to nukes or to anything else, and it's this. I don't think the just war tradition is just war, only war, right? It's simply a codification of the way that Christians have found helpful to adjudicate any occasion in which duties seem to conflict, right? There are times where it seems I've got two duties that are are relevant, but if I do this duty, I can't do this duty, at least to the nth degree. If I do this duty, I'm gonna to have to compromise on this duty. How do I decide which duty to do? So for instance, I use the example of the surgeon. I think they go through something like the just war tradition. A surgeon looks at, you know, a surgeon doesn't walk down the street thinking, whose leg do I get to lop off today, right? <laughs> Hopefully. Um, <laughs> if you have corrections, let me know. But. Uh, you know, is, uh, they're a proper authority, they have surgical experience, they're, they're doctors, they look for a just cause, the child presenting before them has a gangrene leg, um, he has a right intent, he's, he's motivated to save the child's life and to promote health, uh, probability of success, right? Is the operation likely to help the child or is the operation just gonna kill the child? If it's gonna kill the child, let's not carve the leg off, let's just give him the care we can until he passes. Right? Is it the last resort? If I can give him a pill instead of lopping off his leg, let's do that. So it, we go through something like the just word tradition any time we consider anything in which duties seem to conflict, if it's just divorce, if it's just surgery, if it's whatever it happens to be. So I think it can handle anything the modern world throws at us. Yeah, so I would like to pose an objection to Excellent. just war theory that seems the most rational to me and that's that the circumstances of warfare have changed so enormously since Augustine's time that it can't be reasonably applied. Um, when Augustine was formulating, amongst other people, um, the theory, it could be realistically expected that an enemy might be defeated in a few pitched battles mostly involving soldiers. It's not that it always worked out that way, but it was a realistic expectation. But with the growth of um, technology and political techniques coming into the 20th and 21st century, I don't think that's ever realistic anymore. Um, during a war, you almost have to expect, uh, and let me qualify that, a war between to equally matched opponents, you have to expect that a very large amount of civilians are going to die as a result of needing to break the abil enemy's ability to fight. Uh, to put it pithily, Augustine might have expected to win a war by breaking an enemy's sword. Uh, Woodrow Wilson had to expect to win a war by breaking an enemy's back. And so I, my main objection to just war theory is I'm just not sure it can account for the fact that while we might be able to formulate a way in which violence doesn't intrinsically involve killing civilians, uh, under, modern cir under, under modern circumstances, it almost certainly will. Go ahead. You don't have that? <laughs> I'll add. Okay. Um, all right. I've heard uh, you answer this very, very well in another context. Oh, boy. So that means i got to dig up that other context and think of when I answered it well. Um, I'm going to, you know, for, first I refer to what I just said previously. I think, you know, I, I think the just word theory can, or tradition, not theory, uh, can hold up to anything the modern world throws at it, in part because of what are the criteria on, right? And then the question always happens, has to be, what are the alternatives? Um, you look at a case as grotesque as, uh, you know, World War II, where all the just war tradition asks is it, it doesn't demand that civilians not die. It asks that um, you limit to the extent possible uh, the threats to civilians, um, the threats that are warranted because you are also trying to rescue civilians, right? All of these sort of complex tensions. 
Um, it asks that you take a probability measurement. You know, is there more good that is likely to come from overturning the just causes? So the just causes, again, I'm trying to protect the innocent. I'm trying to take back the things that have been wrongly taken or requite the injustices. Or I'm trying to punish sufficiently grave evils. So is the good likely to come from overturning those things, likely to outweigh the evils that happen? That's, that's the calculation that needs to be made, not whether or not any civilians are going to die. Um, but what are the circumstances that we're facing? What are the threats against the civilians? So you know, I'm writing this grotesque book on the bombing of Hiroshima. And I'm suggesting that that was the most moral thing that could be done at the time. There was nothing else in that occasion that could have been more moral to do than drop that bomb. Because if saving innocent lives is your thing, dropping that bomb indisputably saved more innocent lives. Um, and if you want to take it back and say, well, that's because we've already gotten to Hiroshima. The war should have been fought in the first place. More civilians would have died under Japanese occupation um, if it was left unchallenged than did die in World War II. That's, to me, seemingly indisputable, or essentially indisputable. Um, so I just think I, I understand the tensions of modern war. Uh, I, don't think they, I, I don't think they sufficiently challenge the criteria in which the tradition asks us to contemplate fighting. Um, I don't know if that's how I answered it in the past that made you so happy. Yeah. Or if there's more yeah. to be said. Yeah. You know, I, I think we're sympathetic to the you know, to that initial notion about how destructive modern warfare can be. Um, but what's the, the flip side, like what Mark said earlier about drone technology and things, is the narrowing of the loss of life that, that has happened in, in some of the recent conflicts. It isn't the case, though, that in the historical case that there are so many fewer uh, deaths I mean, think about the time that Augustine, reflecting in the few centuries before his own lifetime, Romans would go in and de absolutely destroy a city. Uh, they, didn't, and they destroyed Carthage. Think about what they did in Israel in AD 70. They essentially destroyed a people group and, and sent them out. Aquinas writing generations later, the, maybe the second greatest just war thinker, is writing at the same time as, as Genghis Khan, is obliterating civilizations. So. Uh, it is true that we have weapons today that can uh, be more destructive than things that we've ever had. Amazingly, uh, they have ca they've caused some deterrence, at least among the great powers over the past 50 years. Um, but throughout human history, what's, what's truly amazing is the absolute destructiveness that people can do, whether it's in Rwanda in 1994 or the Golden Horde in the, tw in the, er in the late 1100s. Uh, to the massive massacring of civilians. I will say this, one thing that's often missed in talking about just war thinking, and Mark and I are part of kind of a study group talking about this is, there, what we do need is we need, do need just leaders who are saying, how do we best prepare to deter from war breaking out? And how do we best train our, our military officers, our judge advocate generals like Professor Iglesias was in his Navy career? How do we best prepare our young people to if they have to go to war, they fight in a restrained fashion under the laws of armed conflict. And I would say that part of, of, of proper or legitimate political authority, that first principle, is doing all of those preparatory things to try to keep uh, the use of force, whether by law enforcement or by military, as restrained as possible. Do you want to respond? Go, go right ahead. I think, I think it allowed me to kind of whittle my question sure. down to a nub. Um, I think Hiroshima is a good example because I think what I really want to understand from your guys' perspective is what, whether or not there is any wartime action that cannot be morally justified by it leading to a greater good in the future. Yeah, yeah. You know, let me just say one thing from Augustine in which he said, People will say that the, <clears throat> that the ultimate evil in war is that people die. And then he almost kind of laughs and he says, everybody dies. That the evil in war is, when, is, is hatred, bitterness, greed, envy, the lust for power, the giving into, for lack of a better word, the dark side, and having a rapacious, cruel approach uh, 
to actually fellow human beings, fellow image bearers. That's the great evil in war uh, because the Bible teaches everyone dies and then comes the judgment. And, and that perspective, I think, really does animate the just war tradition in, in trying to answer the very important, you're asking a, 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 like a real, real question. And that is, you know, war is not, it's not the glorious moment. There are, there are terrible things that happen in war. How do we best limit them? How do we best channel that? And the just war tradition's answer has been under authority, <laughs> right cause, right intention. And we ought to be training our personnel in channeling them in that direction. And I, I don't want to leave you with the impression, if I do buy the book later and, 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 and that'll resolve it, but I don't want you to leave with the impression now that, that I think that was a total commercial, <laughs> shameless plug. Um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that I think the argument for Hiroshima is purely utilitarian, the greatest good for the greatest number, some craziness like that. So again, going back to what I said about just war, what it does is it helps us determine what do we do when two or more moral duties conflict, right? Um, where the moral duties aren't conflicting, do the moral duty. Done, right? So if somehow, like, killing that completely innocent, oh, all right, let's just use a real example. Elizabeth Anscombe, right, who apparently is the only person that C.S. Lewis ever thought he lost an argument to. Uh, she wrote what is, what is really just, just monumental nonsense about uh, Truman's decision to drop the atomic bomb. And one of the things that she said, you know, people were suggesting to her is that, oh, if you're opposed to the dropping of the bomb, then sh you know, you'd be opposed if somebody came to you and said, well, if you could just kill one baby, and I think they said boil one baby, and you would save millions of lives, you wouldn't do it. And she was, her response was, right, I wouldn't do it. And my response to her is, right, you shouldn't do it, because there, like, there's no moral conflict here. Right? My duty is to this innocent child. In Hiroshima, the duties, you know, I have a duty to the innocent Japanese. I have a duty to the innocent Chinese dying at about the rate of 8,000 a day from December 1944 onward. That's 250,000 a month. Um, I have a duty to um, conscripts and post Pearl Harbor volunteers in the American and Allied forces. On and on and on. There's all these clashing moral duties. Now, what do we do? And then if you go through the long argument about what, you know, the, the circumstances in Hiroshima, you determine, however grotesque it is, or I determine however grotesque it is, that we have reason to prefer the innocent lives of the Chinese and the Allies over the innocent lives of the Japanese. And we have to choose. If we don't have to choose, don't choose, right? We had to choose. So it's not the greatest good for the greatest number. It's in this moment, justice and love demand, it seems to me, X, right? It's never about pure utilitarianism. But when duties conflict, um, the next thing you go down to is you say, okay, what are the consequences of following this duty versus this duty? Um, what are the consequences of following that duty versus this duty? So consequences matter, but not in the first degree. That's my second degree. Thank you all for coming. Um, if some of you still have questions for our speakers, you can, of course, come up and ask them. Uh, remember your 10% discount in the bookshop. And thank you. Let's all thank again. Thank you. Good job. Good job.